Lord be with you. Good morning. My name is Martha Bass. <clears throat> to all persons gathered in our virtual or our brick and mortar sanctuary here, welcome to worship with Grace Presbyterian Church. Virtual worshipers are encouraged to send a Facebook greeting and those in-person guests, there are guest cards in the pew pockets in front of you. If you'd fill those out and leave them in the offering plate at the doors as you leave, that would be wonderful. This coming Friday, February 25th, is the requested deadline to RSVP for this year's Fat Tuesday Pancake Dinner. From our newsletter, there is a direct RSVP link, and you will also find it as a Facebook event. And where there's a Fat Tuesday, Ash Wednesday will follow and brings with it the season of Lent. This year, we are encouraged to travel lightly and live extravagantly. Check the gracetuscaloosa.org website, the e-newsletter, and the Facebook page for worship and event schedules. Next Sunday, February 27th, Reverend Kathy will be back with us as usual, and after worship, we will celebrate her fifth anniversary as Myth Minister of Grace Presbyterian. Today, it is our joy to worship, to welcome guest preacher, Reverend Lori Maxley. Maxie, I'm sorry about that. I knew I was going to do that too. A longtime colleague of, Kathy, of Reverend Kathy, Lori is no stranger to Grace. She has assisted with Christmas Eve services, accompanied worship, sung with vocal ensembles, and you frequently see her at Grace with her husband Richard and their daughters Kat, Isabella, and Sophia. After 20 years of local church ministry, she resigned to found and lead the House Tuscaloosa a literacy center and used bookstore on the Stillman College campus. You can read more about Lori in today's printed bulletin. Reverend Maxie, our prayers are with you as you lead us in worship today and bring us today's message. Celebrating Christ's universal love, the body of Christ known as Grace Presbyterian seeks to do justice, embrace kindness, and walk humbly with God. In the quiet of this moment, listen and watch for the movement of God's Holy Spirit. Be still and know that I am God. Be Please join me in the call to worship. Find me at your table. We'll share your food. Find me in your resources. We'll share your riches. Find me in your power. We'll share your mercy. Find me in your pain. We'll share your forgiveness. Find me in your generosity. We'll share all and expect nothing in return. In community, seek holiness. We follow you in love, generosity, joy. In the world, share my desire. We follow you in justice, mercy, peace for all. Let us pray. Lord, help me to relax in your presence. Take me from the tension that makes peace impossible. Take me from the anxiety that distracts me. Take from me the worries that blind my sight. Take from me the distress that hides your joy. Help me fully present to you in this time of worship. Amen. <laughs> Oh, 
Please be seated. Since we have Jesus, our great high priest, who has passed through the heavens, let us draw near to the throne of grace with confidence that we may receive mercy and grace in our time of need. Please join me in a prayer of confession. Holy One, your call is deceptively simple. Treat others as you would have them treat you, and yet we cling to self-serving ways which separate us from your beloved creation. Christ, have mercy. You call us to turn our lives around, to risk repentance and learn forgiveness, to work with patience and diligence to prepare the way for your reign, but we get discouraged and give up too soon. Lord, have mercy. You call us to be full of joyful confidence, to create community where all have enough for abundant life, but we burden ourselves with anxiety and fear. Christ, have mercy. You call us to speak out in the presence of injustice, but too often we do not challenge words and actions rooted in hate. Holy One, have mercy. Our God is good and generous and loving. Trust in Jesus' promise. Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. For the measure you give will be the measure you get back. Having been reconciled with God, let us be reconciled with one another. The peace of Christ be with you. Please safely share signs of peace with one another. Good morning. Today in our Bible stories, we hear a lot about forgiveness. We hear a story about somebody named Joseph, not Jesus's dad, but a Joseph who lived a long time ago, and about how he forgave his brothers. And then we get to hear Jesus talking about forgiving. So I'm going to share a story with you today um, that is called uh, Ruby Bridges. It's about a little girl well, she's not, she's not little anymore, but when she was and she wanted to go to school, it wasn't as easy as it is now because Ruby is black. And back when she was little in 1967, when her family moved to New Orleans, things were different. Ruby's father worked in the daytime and Ruby's mother worked at night. And at that time, black children and white children went to separate schools in New Orleans. The back, black children were not able to receive the same education as the white children, and it wasn't fair, and it was against the nation's law. So in 1960, a judge ordered four black girls to go to two white schools. Three of the girls were sent to one school, and six-year-old Ruby was sent to first grade at the William France Elementary School. There's Ruby's family at church. They're a little worried about this, but they were also proud. We sat there and prayed to God, Ruby's mother said, that we'd all be strong and we'd have courage and we'd get through any trouble and that Ruby would be a good girl and she'd hold her head up high and be a credit to her own people and a credit to all the American people. So we prayed long and we prayed hard. And there's Ruby ready for school on the first day. And look at the angry crowd that gathered around and they were shouting ugly, hateful things at her and the police didn't help. 
So the president of the United States ordered federal marshals to walk with Ruby into the school building every day for weeks that turned into months. Ruby walked through that angry crowd. They would shout at her and she would just keep on walking and wouldn't say a word. There's Ruby all by herself at school because the other children didn't come. The white people in the neighborhood would not send their children to school. When, so when Ruby got inside, there she was learning alone and playing alone and eating alone. But she came with a big smile, ready to learn. She was polite, said her teacher, Mrs. Henry, and she worked so well. She didn't seem nervous or anxious or irritable or scared. She seemed as normal and relaxed as any child I've ever taught. So Ruby began, how, began learning how to read and write in an empty classroom, in an empty building. Sometimes I'd look at her and wonder how she did it, said Mrs. Henry how she went by those angry crowds all by herself and seemed so relaxed. Mrs. Henry would question Ruby in order to find out if the girl was really nervous and afraid, even though she seemed so calm and confident. But Ruby kept saying she was doing fine. The teacher decided to wait and see if Ruby would keep on being so relaxed and hopeful or if she'd gradually begin to wear down or decide that she didn't want to go to school. And then one morning something happened. Mrs. Henry was standing at the window of her classroom watching Ruby walk into the school, walk through the angry crowds. But this time Ruby stopped right in front of the mob of howling and screaming people. She stood there facing them and she seemed to be talking to them. Mrs. Henry saw Ruby's lips moving and wondered what Ruby could be saying. The crowd seemed angry enough to kill her. The marshals were frightened. They tried to persuade Ruby to move along. They tried to hurry her into the school, but Ruby wouldn't budge. Then Ruby stopped talking and walked into the school. When she went into the classroom, Mrs. Henry asked her what happened. Mrs. Henry told Ruby that she'd been watching and that she was surprised when Ruby stopped and talked with the people in the mob. Ruby became irritated. I didn't stop and talk with them, she said. Ruby, I saw you talking, Mrs. Henry said. I saw your lips moving. I wasn't talking, said Ruby. I was praying. I was praying for them. Every morning, Ruby had stopped a few blocks away from school to say a prayer for the people who hated her. The people who hated her because of the color of her skin. This morning she forgot until she was already in the middle of the angry crowd. When school was over for the day, Ruby hurried through the mob as usual. After she walked a few blocks and the crowd was behind her, Ruby said the prayer she repeat, repeated twice a day, before and after school. Please God, try to forgive these people because even if they say those bad things, they don't know what they're doing. So you could forgive them just like you did those folks a long time ago when they said terrible things about you. So that's Ruby Bridges story and Ruby Ruby kept going to school and she kept learning and the other children came back, came back to school too, which was a really happy thing. And they, they began learning together, children of all different colors. And of course we know that's the way it should be. But I wanted to share with you this story about Ruby forgiving these people that she didn't know, people who said such mean and hateful things to her. I don't know if her prayer changed them, but it sure gave her the strength to do hard things. And it kept her from getting too angry and hateful towards them. It's hard, forgiveness is hard, but we keep practicing, don't we? Let's have a prayer. Dear God, forgiving is hard work. So help us when it's time to forgive. 
to have the words to say. Help us to learn from Jesus and from people like Joseph, from people in the Bible who learned how to forgive in your, in your love. Amen. Please join me in the prayer for illumination. Let us pray. Guide us, O God, by your word and Holy Spirit, that in your light we may see light, in your truth find freedom, and in your will discover peace. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. After years of conflict, slavery, and imprisonment, and a rise to greatness, Joseph is reunited with his brothers and comes to see God's providential hand in all that has happened. Your first scripture reading is from Genesis 45, 3 through 11. Joseph said that his, to his brothers, I'm Joseph. Is my father really still alive? His brothers couldn't respond because they were terrified before him. Joseph said to his brothers, come closer to me. And they moved closer. He said, I'm your brother, Joseph, the one you sold to Egypt. Now don't be upset and don't be angry with yourselves that you sold me here. Actually, God sent me before you to save lives. We've already had two years of famine in the land, and there are five years left without planting or harvesting. God sent me before you to make sure you'd survive and to rescue your lives in this amazing way. You didn't send me here. It was God who made me a father to Pharaoh, master of his entire house, and ruler of the land of Egypt. Hurry and go back to your father. Tell him this is what your son Joseph said. God has made me a master of all Egypt. Come down to me. Don't delay. You may live in the land of Goshen, so you will be near me. Your children, your grandchildren, your flocks and herds, and everyone with you. I will support you there, so you, your household, and everyone with you won't starve, since the famine will still last five years. The word of the Lord. Your psalm reading is from 37, verse 1 through 4. Don't be upset over evildoers. Don't be jealous of those who do wrong, because they will fade fast like grass. They will wither like green vegetables. Trust the Lord and do good. Live in the land in firm faithfulness. Enjoy the Lord, and he will give you what your heart asks. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust him. He will act, and he will make your righteousness shine like the dawn, your justice like high noon. Be still and know be still before the Lord and wait for him. Don't get upset when someone asks, gets ahead, someone who invents evil schemes. Let go of anger and leave rage behind. Don't get upset. It will only lead to evil. Because evildoers will be eliminated. But those who hope in the Lord, they will possess the land. In just a little while, the wicked won't exist. If you go looking around their place, they won't be there. But the weak will inherit the land. They will enjoy a surplus of peace.
Our gospel reading for today is found in Luke 6, verses 27 through 38. But I say to you who are willing to hear, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. If someone slaps you on the cheek, offer the other one as well. If someone takes your coat, don't withhold your shirt either. Give to everyone who asks, and don't demand your things back from those who take them. Treat people in the same way that you want them to treat you. If you love those who love you, why should you be commended? Even sinners love those who love them. If you do good to those who do good to you, why should you be commended? Even sinners do that. If you lend to those from whom you expect your payment, why should you be commended? Even sinners lend to sinners expecting to be paid back in full. Instead, love your enemies, do good, and lend expecting nothing in return. If you do, you will have a great reward. You will be acting the way children of the Most High act. For God is kind to ungrateful and wicked people. Be compassionate just as your Father is compassionate. Don't judge and you won't be judged. Don't condemn and you won't be condemned. Forgive and you will be forgiven. Give and it will be given to you. A good portion, packed down, firmly shaken, and overflowing will fall into your lap. The portion you give will determine the portion you receive in return. Holy wisdom, holy word. Thanks be to God. Well, when I read the lectionary text for today, I chuckled a little bit because Psalm 37 is one of the first passages that I remember my mother teaching me in middle or high school. See, I had a problem with people not acting right, and then they got to be student of the month or club president or some other recognition. You know those students who act one way in front of the teachers and another way in front of everybody else? Those classmates who contribute nothing to the group project and still get an A? There are adults like that too. But I loved the second verse where it said the wrongdoers would fade and wither. And later what it says, the evildoers will be eliminated and won't exist anymore. And there were times I wanted to help speed up that process. But that's picking out single verses and missing the entire point. There is no place in the Christian life for vengeance or retaliation. God calls us to live differently. God calls us to love the people who are hardest to love. Jesus teaches us not to judge, to be merciful, to offer forgiveness, and that is a hard teaching. But with the Holy Spirit's help, we're going to dig into these scriptures today. Let's pray. God of grace and love, may the words I speak be those you want spoken. May the words we hear be those you want heard. And may the way we obey be for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So let's start with the gospel reading. Last week, we read the first part of Jesus' Sermon on the Plain. Now this is much like the Sermon on the Mount that you find and read in Matthew. These are instructions to Jesus' disciples, to those who have already responded, who have already decided to follow Jesus. And these teachings were radical, ridiculous even. Jesus turned society upside down with the way he taught his disciples to live. Jesus also made the religious leaders and the churchy people really angry because he did not interpret the Old Testament law the way they thought he should. The blessings and the curses didn't make sense. Some people who heard Jesus teach probably laughed out loud, and with good reason. In a world where it was an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, what did Jesus mean by loving your enemies, blessing those who curse you, and praying for those who abuse you? These scriptures are so packed that we cannot talk about everything today, or we're going to be here for hours and you won't let me preach again. So as I wrestled and prayed and thought and prayed, I, I focused in on forgiveness. And forgiveness alone is a huge topic that we will not possibly talk about everything today. 
but we can't walk in the way of love that Jesus teaches us unless we learn how to forgive, which again is a really hard teaching. It's not fun to talk about forgiveness, but none of you came to worship today thinking, I would really like a challenge today. Maybe I'll be asked to forgive somebody. But as Richard encouraged us last week, we have to be honest with ourselves, with each other, and with God. So forgiveness. What is it? What does it mean to forgive? If you ask Google, the first definition reads to stop feeling angry or resentful towards someone for an offense, flaw, or mistake. And I don't know about you, but that is not helpful for me. How do you just stop feeling angry and resentful? How do you forgive when people and institutions hurt you over and over and over again? So there's another way to think about forgiveness and just see if this helps you. Think of forgiveness in terms of canceling a debt. You owe someone money or time or lunch and they say, forget about it, it's covered. You don't have to pay it back. Your debt is canceled, it's forgiven. Forgiveness isn't passive. It's not some feel-good, let's all get along, kumbaya, kiss and make up feeling. It is not that. It's not letting people walk all over you and continue in abusive patterns. Forgiveness can happen without justice and reconciliation. Forgiveness is an active acknowledgement that a wrong has been committed. Someone owes you a debt but it's a debt they won't be able to pay, either because they won't admit they're wrong or they can't pay it because we are all broken people. But do you know who can right the wrong and who can correct the injustice who has already paid the debt? God. On the cross, Jesus paid for every debt we owe to God. Listen to this. Hear me. Yes, Jesus owed the, every debt we owe to God. Jesus paid for that. But Jesus also paid for every debt that we owe each other. And so to forgive means that I stop trying to get justice on my own. To forgive means that I stop trying to collect on the debt someone owes me. To forgive is to mark the debt as canceled because Jesus has already paid it. To forgive is to focus on the grace that God has given us and to extend that grace even to our enemies. Now, the story of Joseph in the Old Testament is an example of forgiveness, but it's one we need to be careful with. The section we read today is near the end of Joseph's story. But back in Genesis 37, we learn that his brothers could not stand him. Joseph was his father's favorite. He got special treatment, and his brothers had enough. They decided they are going to kill him. Then they realized they could make some money, so they sold him into slavery. And in Egypt, Joseph worked himself up from slave to head of Potiphar's house. From there, he ended up back in prison for no fault of his own. But he proved successful by interpreting dreams. He gets out of prison and ends up as Pharaoh's second in command. There's a famine, and Joseph's brothers come to Egypt looking for help. They run into Joseph, but they don't know it's him. And at that point, Joseph could have had them killed. Joseph could have put them into slavery. They owed Joseph a huge debt. They had done wrong to Joseph. But Joseph chose to focus on the grace of God that has sustained him through those years in Egypt. Joseph extended that grace and forgiveness to his family. Was it easy for Joseph to forgive? My guess is no. Joseph didn't do anything wrong. Maybe he was a little arrogant, strutting around in his coat of many colors, but Joseph was his kid. The adults shouldn't have treated that way and let him act like that. It certainly doesn't appear Joseph did anything wrong with Potiphar's wife. Joseph had been sitting with these injustices for a long time. It had been at least 20 years since Joseph had seen his brothers 
and over half of those have been spent as a slave or in jail. I imagine that Joseph had done a lot of questioning and wrestling with why this stuff kept happening. I imagine that through the years, Joseph was hurt and angry and wanted his brothers and Potiphar and everyone who had done him wrong to suffer the way he had suffered. It is recorded in the Bible that the first time Joseph saw his brothers, he spoke harshly to them. He put them in jail for three days. He seems to have taken some measure of revenge on them. If it wasn't revenge, maybe he was testing them to see if they'd changed and were going to act differently. But as we read today, Joseph's story ends with a beautiful picture of reconciliation. But that's not always our reality. People don't always admit they're wrong. Justice is not always served. Would Joseph have forgiven them? if he had remained a slave his entire life or never gotten out of jail? Would Joseph have forgiven them if they had not changed and admitted they were wrong? Those are questions we don't have answers to and we wrestle with. But in our gospel reading, Jesus calls us to love our enemies. Do good to those who hate us. Bless those who curse us. Pray for those who mistreat us. To forgive. Again, Jesus is not calling us to be passive and let people walk all over us. Jesus is calling us to be active, to deliberately treat people like God treats us. Forgiveness is not a feeling. Forgiveness is an active decision to cancel someone's debts. It's release them to God. Forgiveness is a choice to undermine hostility and violence, to be part of spreading God's kingdom on earth. The aim of forgiveness is reconciliation. But reconciliation must be rooted in truth and repentance. And there are times in real life when some people will never seek to make amends. There are times when some folks will never turn away and change their hurtful behaviors. There are times when reconciliation is not possible. But forgiveness is always possible. Forgiveness is only possible when we stop getting upset over evildoers. Forgiveness is only possible when we stop being jealous of those who do wrong. Forgiveness is only possible when we let go of anger and leave rage behind. Forgiveness is only possible when we respond with grace instead of reacting with words or actions that seek to answer hurt with more hurt. Forgiveness is only possible when we trust the Lord for our healing and stop expecting it to come from that other person. Forgiveness is only possible because we are children of God. Forgiveness is only possible when we remember that Jesus died for us, paying our debts while we were still sinners. Forgiveness is only possible because we have the Holy Spirit to help us forgive. Forgiveness is a hard teaching. If it was easy, everyone would do it. If it was easy, we wouldn't need God. There's a little song a friend taught me to sing when I'm having trouble being a mom. It goes like this. Lord, help me, Lord, help me, Lord, help me love my kids. Lord, help me, Lord, help me, Lord, help me love my kids. Lord, help me, Lord, help me, Lord, help me love my kids. Lord, help me love my kids so I don't kill them. (laughs) Of course, we don't practice violence in our house, so I'm never going to do that. But (laughs) it's a great reminder to me to stop. Don't react. Don't repay hurt with more hurt. Ask God for help. It's a reminder that I cannot do anything without God. In my own power, I can't love my kids. I can't love that committee member. I can't love that kid who sits next to me in school and won't, just won't leave me alone. can't love that person who just voted to pass another unfair law. I can't love that person who keeps hurting me over and over again. I can't forgive. But I can ask for God's help. I can be still before God. I can trust God to heal me and help me to forgive.
and you can too. Thanks be to God. Amen. Please stand in body and spirit as we affirm our faith together. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the word made flesh to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to live with respect in creation, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our hope. In life, in death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Amen. First of all, I'd really like to thank Matt Hughes for and also for her wonderful work in the community in establishing the House Tuscaloosa. Um, you know, we're just really, really thankful for you. Um, Good news, um, Tommy Lessinger is home from the hospital. Um, I, don't, I don't have much more information than that, but that, that is a good thing. Um, we certainly want to keep in our prayers the people and the land of the Ukraine um, and all that they're facing. Um, we need prayers for the elimination of gun violence in our community, our state, and across, across the country. Um, any, any prayers from the congregation? Okay, well, let us pray. We trust in you, our God. We trust in you, knowing that life even at the best of times, can be chaotic. At the most difficult times, the ones when we can't understand what's around the corner, when we don't know what to do or where to go or how to be, all we can do is trust in you. In the midst of the pain in our own lives, in the midst of the world's pain, we trust. We trust in your love shown over and over and over again throughout all times and all space. And we believe that your love, in your love, we can be a reflection of your presence in this broken world. We pray this prayer in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Now let us join our hearts and voices to pray the um, prayer that the Lord taught us using whatever words are most comfortable for you. 
our Mother and Father God, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debts. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory of the world. Amen. When we give our gifts, we are witnesses to the transforming love of God in Christ. Thank you for your generosity in supporting the mission of grace. Let us pray. Lord, let our congregation be a witness to you, immersed in scripture, constant in prayer, joyful in worship, generous in giving, a loving, supporting community reaching out to those in need. Accept these gifts we offer in Jesus' name. Amen. Here is the table of the Lord. We are gathered to his supper, a foretaste of things eternal. Come when you are fearful to be made new in love. Come when you are doubtful to be made strong in faith. Come when you are regretful and be made whole. Come old and young. There is room for all. Pray. God of life, pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and those at home, and on these gifts, that in the breaking of this bread and the drinking of this wine, we may know the presence of the living Christ and be renewed as the body of Christ for the world, redeemed by Christ's love, until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at your table forever. Through Christ, with Christ, in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. So we remember that on the night Jesus was arrested, he gathered his followers. He took bread. He asked God to bless it, and he broke it. Jesus offered it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Take and eat. And after the meal, he took the cup and he poured it out for them, saying, this is my new covenant, a new promise poured out with my love for the forgiveness of many. Take and drink. And so, friends, we come to this table to remember that meal and to celebrate it again. Communion servers, please come. This is an open table. All are welcome. We invite you to take a piece of gluten-free bread and a cup. Take them with you back to your seat. And we'll take communion together with those who are worshiping from home.
the gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. For the bread we have eaten, for the wine we have tasted, for the life we have received, we thank you, God. Help us to be your church in the days, weeks, and years to come, filled and refreshed by your constant love. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Today was a hard teaching. Forgiveness isn't easy and loving other people isn't easy, but keep asking God for help. And may the blessings of the triune God, creator, redeemer, and sustainer be yours today as you go and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>